Welcome back to No Apologies on Deck. I am your host, Lori Hins, and with me, I'm very pleased to have Gary Emineth. Gary Emineth played a prominent role in the Republican Party previously as its chair, the NDGOP chair. What years? 2007 to 2010. And then also a pretty prominent role in uh, yesterday's NDGOP convention, interestingly. That was, a, that was a, something people probably did not see coming at all. Oh, I actually I didn't see it coming early <laughs> myself. <laughs> it kind of happened kind of um, at the last minute. And I think the movement of conservatives in this whole rules fight, people needed a... Um, somebody to kind of speak to it. An and advocate? I, yeah, and I thought there's a chance that I would have an opportunity and the way it unfolded, not allowing the candidates to even speak, but I was willing to put my name forward. But, you know, I went to bed um, in Grassy Butte um, Friday night thinking, you know, I'm not sure this is even going to happen. So I wasn't really prepared, you know, in the sense that it had to happen. But I think someone needed to put a voice to it and help rally the grassroots to it, and I was happy to put my name forward on it. So. Let's explain what, what actually happened. What began in the beginning after the program, um, the, the invocation and the national anthem mm -hmm. and all that stuff was done. After that was finished and we came back, um, well, it was early on that they, uh, the, a number of individuals came up and did a point of inquiry. Yes. And they wanted to know certain things about the the way the things were going to go. And one of the questions was, is there going to be allowed nominations for permanent chair of the convention? Now, this is not the chairman mm -hmm. of the NDGOP, per se. This is just the convention chair. Yes, that's correct. And, and what happened is, I mean, there's kind of a number of weird things that I would say, normally, the, I think just the first time in my memory the convention was one day. Right. It's normally two days, because you want to carry it over into the next. But even more ironic or weird, I would say, is it didn't start till 11. So rather than starting at 9 or 9.30, it started at 11, and then it immediately gets derailed because they couldn't get the credentials. But that's not uncommon. The credentials, Takes I mean, time. I've chaired two conventions, and it, and it happens, and so I won't go down that bunny trail. However, the fact that the convention started at 11, they got through some basic half hours worth of ceremonies, getting things organized, which you talked earlier in the previous segment. Sure. But to actually have um, the credentials be out of sync, because they knew what was coming, to take a whole hour, and there's a lot of, there's some speculation about why that happened, and I'm not going to go there, other than to say that we went right to lunch. And if we just started at 9, so it creates this whole unrest related to that. And, and the, the, the concern was, the chair knew there was going to be a name placed in nomination. Rumors were that it was mine. I walked into the hall. I got to the hall literally at 5 to 11 and just registered because I had previously registered. And so I didn't campaign for it. I didn't work the crowd the night before. I was out in Grassy Butte. And, and the fact that um, the people who were going to put my name forward just wanted to be sure to a point of um, inquiry that they were going to allow that to happen. Right. And I thought it ironic. The chairman um, had a guy come in from the National um, party or hired by the Republican National Committee to be the parliamentarian. Normally, they just have a local person. And the reason you do that is to squash some kind of debate, to control the debate. And for, periodically throughout the day, I began to wonder who's chairing the convention, the parliamentarian or the chairman. So it's kind of weird how that evolved. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't really battle. I have to say the conservatives were very respectful. I think people thought there was going to be a, you know, a crazy um, animated fight from the floor. Mm -hmm. The conservative movement did themselves a great service in the, the way they, they respected the chair, they handled themselves well, and, um, and to the point of what happened when they actually finally got their credentials and we come back from lunch, we're ready, you know, an hour and a half late and people are frustrated and they know this convention's got to end at 5 p.m. because they, not only was it one day, it was a half a day, and why did they do that? My opinion is they wanted to squash all that debate and create this this um, monologue, if you will, that this is how it's going to be, and it's going to be tight, so don't disrupt our, our convention. So mm -hmm. it it's really was very establishment, button everything down, and it was, it was inappropriate. It was very disrespectful, in my opinion, to the delegates who drove 200 miles to come in, spend the night, and um, it's kind of too bad that happened. I agree. Um, I would also say that it, it seemed like it, it was a rubber stamp rather than any deliberative assembly, and that was troublesome to me. I like to see, when you have a convention, I like to see debate. I like to hear different sides on things, and it was as if that was an anathema. That was not going to be necessarily allowed. 
You're absolutely right. I mean, the convention is meant to be the highest authority mm -hmm. for the Republican Party. So that every two years when we have a convention, there's a debate whether we're a, a committee that is permanent or is it one that dissolves. So the Republican National Committee literally every four years dissolves and then restarts on the day of the convention. Mm -hmm. Since we're, if you, I don't want to call it a subsidiary, but we're kind of a... Satellite uh, a, from the, the... Yeah, yeah, satellite of the National Party. We would kind of function the same way. And I noticed the chairman struggled to answer that question and he kept looking at the parliamentarian. And I think there's some problems in the definition because the belief is that the party is protected by the First Amendment that in the 14th, that they are independent to run themselves. State law has no um, authority over them because right. it's a protection of free speech and the right to assemble, and that the state can't speak to it. But through the years, the party has deferred to the state and put laws in place. And I personally believe, and many of the delegates felt, that that could be overturned, and it should be. Mm -hmm. I think the challenge going forward is the party going to defer to the primary and state law or will there be some changes in that regard? Because that might be one of the fundamental things that is splitting the party right now. That right there might be one of the main yeah, things. Absolutely. It's just the simply the definition of what the party is and its function and who is um, setting those laws and rules for it. Because I've asked the RNC council before about that question, and they told me, no, the party is paramount. And the state law does, takes, does not take precedence. Your party is, a, is an, a separate organization that gets to make its own rules. You know, the, the convention is meant to be a deliberative body. And if I'd had a chance to speak, I would have spoken to the fact that, as delegates, you came here to make decisions, not just to rubber stamp a, um, a candidate, but it was meant to vote. But also, the platform, the resolutions, as the parties watered those down, I made a, I sent out an email to an email list, and I and I contend that's true. We've watered the platform down so much that 50% of my Democrat friends would um, vote and support the Republican platform. And the reason is because we watered it down and, and made it so that everybody can accept it. And I'm saying, hey, the reason we assemble First Amendment is because we are bound, we're held together by these beliefs, these philosophies that Dr. Rick Becker spoke about earlier. When you speak to those things, those are what really drives us together. It's not that we get to go to a, an event once in a while or twice a year we have a convention. Mm -hmm. It's about our candidates, about the values that a spouse who we support. And, and, and so I have a problem with the way the parties watered everything down in this deliberative body. And I think there's a movement afoot mm -hmm. to give authority back to the delegates. 2,300 people showed up yesterday. Right. And people spent time, um, they spent money, and they have a right to be heard. And, and I think there was some frustration, but it didn't boil, bubble over yesterday or boil over. And um, I'm really thankful that my conservative friends were there were very respectful of that process. I agree with you. I, think, I thought it was a, a very nice assembly. I think people were respectful and kind. They, mm -hmm. were, uh, they were respectful to the, the chair and, and everything that was going on. I was very impressed, too. I, I felt the same way. That was my impression as well. And also, you, you were pretty prominent in this time because you actually had a vote with your name up on the uh, screen there, too. So what happened during the convention was a possible permanent chair of the convention went to a vote and that was the first vote that was held and the totals were 1274 for Perry Schaefer and 999 for Gary Emineth, which is very close. Well, it's ironic. Um, I mean, a message should be sent because I did not campaign for it, could not give a speech. Um, well, actually, it's I showed up disappointing. At, I showed up at five minutes before the convention <laughs> and the, the party needs to hear a message that people are frustrated because I mean, they wouldn't let us give a speech. Um, I think I could have moved the needle, but if that would have happened. However, they, it, well, it's very weird. I haven't quite figured it out. They put our name up on the screen. It took an hour about to get the ballots. The ballots were distributed. After, after we waited an hour to get the credentials, the very next order of business was electing the chairman. And it took it, they knew there was going to be a nomination. And then they, it took an hour to distribute ballots, so they created a whole other unrest for a whole other hour. Then they distributed the ballots with only Perry Schaefer's name on it, and they had to write my name on. Right. So while we were waiting for the ballots for an hour, I'm going like, why couldn't Perry and I have each uh, just spoke for three minutes or four minutes? Sure. So I could have articulated that this is a deliberative body, not a rubber stamp pep rally. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it was. And so, I, you, so when, when you go to these conventions and you see it and why people say, let's have a primary, let's skip the conventions, it's, 
It's because when those kind of things happen, mm -hmm. people, it wasn't smoke-filled room, but, but you kind of go, what's going on behind the curtain? Right. You know, is the wizard back there? Is this, right. are we, you know, is Dorothy, you know? Well, and I was pretty impressed, too, that people were able to write your name on there. And then they said specifically, you have to make sure that you circle it. If you write the name on, you have to circle it or put it, I mean, there was a whole lot, lot of rigmarole to be able to even get your vote. And to come up with almost 1,000 votes just like that, this just spoke to me. I thought that was interesting. Well, and what I would say this is I... I wouldn't necessarily say, I won't, I won't take much credit for it. I think it was the movement was frustrated and needed somebody to do it. And I was willing to say, hey, I would do it. Now, mm -hmm. was I excited to go out and campaign and take on the chairman? <laughs> never no, I never, I never did anything. Never got to give a speech until yeah. the last minute. Now, speaking and, of so, speeches, with, with Becker's campaign and his fiery uh, passion, you have a theory on that with regard to his opponent. Well... I would say, you know, I, I, have, I had heard Rick was going to get into the race, was going to run for something. I thought it was Congress. And when I saw a text came to me on Sunday night from a friend about him taking on Senator Hovind, I go, are you, Senator Hovind, are you kidding me? He's taking on, I mean, John Hovind is literally the most popular politician in the last 50 years right. in North Dakota. Right. And he was going to take them on. And I'm going, are you kidding me, Rick? And so the fact that Rick did it and got to 45% and Rick articulated what he stood for and he got in the race late. He didn't start six months early. He started, I think conventions were already going when Rick yes. got in the race. And the fact that Rick got to 45% right in that number and Hoven has maybe $3 million in the bank. He was organized to run. Um, I mean, I was very encouraged by Senator Hovind. Now, he had mic issues, and I couldn't hardly hear anything he said, and I'm not sure if it was the hall, the mic, his delivery, whatever. But I, I was thrilled to see John Hovind fired up into passion, and Dr. Becker made John Hovind a way better candidate. He sounded way more conservative. I thought it was interesting how much um, Donald Trump was in his video he had, and he was just had Donald Trump splashed everywhere, where John Hovind, I think, tended to be... You know, I'm a little nervous about this guy. And, and even though John was a, a, a supporter of the president, because nobody wants to take him on, especially in North Dakota, that um, um, John Hoven is going to be a better, more conservative U U.S. senator. He talked over and over about his 100 percent this, 100 percent that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, they, and his applause were really about his conservative positions. And I think um, Rick um, is going to make... Senator Hovind, a much better, more conservative senator, and I'm much more happy about that. Now and it was the, good and respectful. The nomination and the seconding speeches for Rick were by fairly unknown people, yeah. um, two women, uh, uh, an older woman and a younger woman. And then for Senator Hovind, he used also a woman for the nomination speech. But then his seconding speech was the junior senator. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. And Kevin is, is a great speaker, and he gave a great speech. And on behalf of Senator Hoven, he did a great job. Um, I, I think the senator, Senator Kramer, did himself a great a, a disservice. While we were having this hour wait time to get our ballots, he kind of piped up from the floor, and made some comments which were totally inappropriate for him as a delegate. No, they never gave any other delegate a chance to be at the mic, and he went on. And I was afraid he was going to get shouted down. And I think, I think, and he did himself um, harm. I think if the if. That 45% that supported Rick Becker, I would say 70% of them are scratching their head going like, why did he have to do that? Why did he have to weigh in? Mm -hmm. And that's going to come to haunt him in the future, I promise you. It's, Interesting. It's, it's going to be a problem for him because Becker's base is kind of Kramer's base. And, and I think that's where Kevin reaches out to him. That establishment crowd that were Hovind's crowd tend not to be Kramer's. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and he shouldn't have done what he did. And I don't know what compelled him. But I guess that's his right as a, a delegate. Right. But why did they give him? They would have they would have shut the mic off on anyone else just because he's a senator to do that. I mean, his right to give the speech is great, but to weigh in on the chairman and to say what he did was inappropriate, and I'm disappointed in him. Interesting. Well, the other thing that was really interesting to me too was the resolution stuff because I had been in the state committee meeting and I had had seen you know what the resolutions were. There were 15 originally. Um, so in the olden days, resolutions could be anything, mm -hmm. and you could have 30. 
30 or 48 of them if you wanted. Now, we, again, in the era of paring everything down, uh, whittled it down to a smaller group doing the resolutions rather than one person or two from each one of the different districts. It was just a small select group. And they, they say that they modeled that after the RNC and what the RNC has done. But they also then only allowed the 15 resolutions, and they had to be germane. They had to be um, sweeping. They couldn't be real specific or anything like that. But then uh, when they were presented to the, they were presented to the crowd. They were presented first um, as a package of 13. Then you had to use different colored ballots. But as at that point in the convention, there wasn't even a quorum. Many, many people had left the convention floor mm. because A, it went over time. B, all of the one contested race had already concluded. So they were really kind of left in the in the shadows, and, and I'd never even heard a count at the end of, of what happened with that, and if there was a quorum or not. So I have a lot of questions about what's going on with the resolutions. Here's the problem with the party. We talked about it in the earlier segment is um, there used to be a platform committee that had a platform, and it was broad-based with the delegates. They used to do the same with the resolutions. And when I was chairman 10 years earlier, we had meetings all around the state, took input, and I welcome that debate, and that's what makes us good. It mm -hmm. sharpens the store, sword. Iron on iron sharpens, you know, they say. And, and I think the whole idea that you have that rigorous discussion, good and bad, you win some, you lose some, but to be identify why I'm a Republican and articulate that and have open debate about it as a group of delegates, mm -hmm. we don't even have a, convention, a, a platform anymore except that the committee voted and there's like 40, 50 people voted on the platform that's on the party and the GOP website. You read it. Um, I'm going like, really? I'm, I mean, this is, this is, they can get 100% of North Dakotans to support this. Mm -hmm. And the resolutions now are been whittled down, less on the committee. And that's why this movement is going to grow. And you're going to see them take this back. Because what I was excited about, I sat in a delegation, um, District 33. I had about 10 young Republicans, all in their 20s conservative, solid Christian young people waiting to start their families. I said, listen, you need to be encouraged by what's happening because I can tell you 10 years from now, um, the party is going to look different and they're going to be bright young people and it's going to be more conservative than it is today. They're respectful people, these young people. And I, for one, have committed that I'm going forward to help these young people. They're the future of the party and that's where we ought to be spending our time. That's what I'm in because they get it. They're well-educated, they're thoughtful, they're conscientious, they're constitution-loving people. They love Jesus or love exactly. God. I mean, they're very good Christian young people. And I, for one, am ecstatic about what's coming. I am, too. Coming. I'm very excited about the future of yeah. the party, too, especially the young people, particularly the young Republicans and college Republicans. Those are my people, and I embrace them and wholeheartedly yeah. look forward to the future. Awesome. Gary, thank you very much for Thanks coming for in and talking me. to me about the convention.